Hi, thank you so much for coming. I hope you're having a really excellent strange loop. I'm, I'm really enjoying it so far. Um, I'm here to talk about turning the database inside out. It's a talk about database architecture and application architecture. It's somewhat related to an open source project that I've been working on over the last while called Apache Samza. Um, my name is Martin Kleppmann. I was, until recently at LinkedIn, working on Samza. At the moment, I'm taking a sabbatical and actually writing a book for O'Reilly. Uh, it's called Designing Data Intensive Applications. It's got this awesome wild boar on the front. Um, the, the idea of this book is to be a kind of a conceptual broad overview over how data systems actually work. So looking at databases, caches, indexes, batch processing, stream processing, how all of that fits together. They're kind of big common ideas which which go through, through all of those areas. And if you can kind of understand those, my thinking is we can all build better applications uh, using, the, using those underlying ideas. So um, the early release, we've just published the first few chapters of that as an early release. Just a few days ago, uh, you can find it at dataintensive.net in case you're interested. Anyway, let's talk about databases. And what I mean is not any particular brand of database. I don't mind whether it's relational or NoSQL no or whatever. I'm more talking about the, the general concept of a database as we use it in building applications. So take, for example, your stereotypical web application architecture where you've got some kind of client, you know, maybe a web browser or a mobile app uh, that's talking to some kind of server-side system which you may call a backend or whatever you like. Um, that will include some kind of business logic, typically access control rules, accepting input, producing output, whatever. Um, and that then, when it needs to store something, typically talks to a database. If it needs to look something up, it'll query a database. That's, that's all very standard, familiar stuff. And the way we typically build those kind of things is that we make this application layer, this, this backend, stateless. Um, that has a lot of advantages. It means that you can just run more and more processes in parallel of, uh, of your backend logic. And uh, if you need to handle more requests, for example, you can just spin up more of these things. And any of those instances is equally well qualified to handle a particular incoming request. Um, because any state that's required will be looked up per request from the database. And that kind of works nicely with HTTP as well, because, of course, HTTP is a stateless protocol. Uh, so it's nice to be able to just root round robin to any application server instance. However, the big problem with this approach is the state has to go somewhere. So the state has to go in our database. Um, and the way we typically use those databases is then actually is this kind of giant global shared mutable state. It's exactly the kind of horrendous thing that in shared memory concurrency we've been trying to get rid of for ages. All of these nice new uh, models for building concurrent system using actors or um, go routines or channels or, and so on, you hear many talks about them. Um, they're all trying to get away from shared memory concurrency where you have to worry about locking um, race conditions, concurrent modification, deadlocks, and all of these sort of problems. We're trying to get rid get away from that. But with databases, we're still stuck with this giant shared mutable state. Mm. So it's worth thinking about, you know, if we're trying to get rid of that in our single process application architecture, what would happen if we try to get rid of this shared mutable state on a whole system level as well? Um, at the moment, it seems kind of the, the main reason why the systems are still being built that way is just the uh, the momentum behind it, that that's the way we've been building them for ages, and we don't really have the tools to do it differently. So this is kind of trying to think about what are the other possibilities of building these stateful systems. Now, in order to try and uh, figure out what kind of routes we could take, I'd like to look at four different examples of things that databases currently do and things that we do with databases. And those four examples might give us some hints as to the direction in which we could take these sort of systems forward. So example number one is replication. Um, you probably all know about the basics of replication. The idea is that you have um, your copy of your data sitting on multiple machines, multiple nodes, and it's the database's job to keep those in sync. 
uh, a common architecture is that you make your write to one designated node, which you could call a master or a leader, and that one is then in charge of making sure that any writes that you make are then copied over to any uh, of the other machines, which you might call followers or, or slaves. And uh, that, that's all very familiar. A lot of systems are built that way. Let's just take an example to think about what actually happens there. So assume a, a shopping cart example. Um, this is using a relational data model, but it's not limited to relational at all. Um, say you have a table with three columns. There are customers, there are products, and quantity. So how many of a particular product does a particular customer have in their shopping cart? And now say the, one of the customer 123 changes their mind, and instead of wanting one of product 999, they want three. So you then issue this query to the database saying, update uh, where some conditions, blah, blah, change the state of the database from one to three. And uh, the result is then that the database will go and apply that mutation in the appropriate place. Now, I was talking about replication. What does this mean in the case of replication? Well, you will typically make this update query to your master, to your leader, and it will then locally execute that and apply it. And now, there are several different ways how this replication can happen. How does this write get to the other nodes? Um, different databases implement this differently. You can like ship the write-ahead log around, for example, or what's sometimes done is use a logical log as well. And uh, the logical log will look something like this. The leader database produces some event which says something like for some kind of internal row or tuple identifier, this is the old state, this is the new state you should change it to. Now this is, you know, it seems kind of nothing special, but actually notice what has happened here. You've got at the top, you've got basically an imperative statement saying, make the state mutation for me for some rows matching some conditions. Whereas below this event that's being replicated from one machine to the other actually has a different form. It has a different char characteristic. What it's actually saying is, at a particular point in time, a certain customer decided to change the product of a, uh, the quantity of a certain product from one to three. And this is actually an, a fact. You know, even if the customer later removes it from their cart again, or if they change the quantity again, or if they go away and never buy it, the fact that they, at this point in time, made this modification remains true. This is an immutable fact compared to an imperative modification. So we can see that internally databases are actually already using this idea of immutability. Hold that thought for now. I'm going to talk about some completely different things and then come to back to this idea later. The second one of these four things I want to talk about is totally different, it's secondary indexing. Uh, again, you're probably familiar with what a secondary index is in a relational database. It's like the bread and butter. You've got some kind of table, use the same example again. Um, and if you want to query it by different fields, you probably want different indexes in order to be able to find the matching rows efficiently. So what you would do is uh, run some SQL, uh, creating an index, for example, on the customer ID column and a separate index on the product ID column. So you could use either of those in, in a query then. So you could look up, for example, which customers have a certain product in their shopping cart right now. Now, what does a database do when you run one of these queries? Well, it will go through, uh, it will go through the, the entire table, and it will create an auxiliary data structure for each index that you've created. So each index will have this separate data structure which represents the information in the base table in some different way. And this index is usually some kind of key value-like structure where the keys will actually be taking the values from a particular column uh, that you're trying to index and use those as the keys in the index. Um, and if you're wanting to index different columns, well, for the other index, you would take the content of a different column, use that as the keys of the index. The point being of this is that the process of going from this base table to, uh, to these, these views here, these um, indexes, is completely mechanical. The database knows how to do that. You simply tell it, instruct it, create me an index, and it knows what to do. And whenever the data in the underlying table changes, the database will then automatically update these indexes to be consistent. And it actually does that in a transactional way. So 
you can be sure that any subsequent transactions that access the index will see the data in the index in the same state as it is in the underlying table. That's kind of cool, actually. Um, what's even cooler is that some databases let you do this concurrently with processing write queries. So uh, this is a Postgres syntax, for example. It'll let you, say, create index concurrently. So if, you're, if you've got a huge table and creating the index takes several hours, that's no problem. You don't have to stop writes to your table. You, your application can still continue running normally processing writes. And the database somehow internally figures out how to take, like it has to scan the entire table to build this index. But at the same time, it's tracking this running, this moving target. And at the end, when it's finished building the index, it's somehow transactionally consistent with what the underlying data is saying, despite the table having changed in the meantime. That's rather cool. That was number two thing that I was, wanted to talk about. Number three. And number three is different, it's caching. What I'm talking about here is the kind of application level caching that you'll get typically as uh, you, know, you build some kind of app, web app, it becomes popular, you're hitting the database too hard or it's getting too slow, so you introduce some memcache or some Redis or whatever. Um, and the way uh, many people introduce those kind of caches into an application is to actually manage the cache in application code. So you might, for example, uh, incoming request comes into the app using some key, you will first look in your cache. Is it in the cache? No, if it's not in the cache, that's a miss. So then you will go to the underlying database, query that, on the way back out, you actually write the, the results that you, want, that you would have wanted to see in the cache. You write that back into the cache. So that next time round, if someone asks for the same thing again, uh, they can get it from the cache rather than hitting the database. And then you return it back out to the client. So this, uh, this is a very common pattern, but I think there are a whole lot of problems with that. Um, the first problem is there's this stereotypical quote that everyone always brings out about there being two hard problems in computer science which I can't stand any anymore. Um, <laughs> but, but it's true that like, if, you're, if you're running a cache like this and you have to worry about invalidating it yourself, that, that is actually quite a problem. So you're, uh, again, you've got some data in the, in the underlying table is changing. How do you know that you have to update information in the cache uh, so that it's accordingly up to date? You know, you might choose Whenever you make a write, you also make a write to the cache, or you might choose to just expire it, or you might choose to just have a TTL um, and let it fall out of the cache and accept stale reads in the meantime. You have to think a lot about those sort of things. Another issue there is it, this thing is actually very prone to race conditions, and I think most of us building these sort of applications just kind of pretend that the race condition doesn't exist because it's just too much to think about. <laughs> but if you think about it, if you're like, Say you've got two processes concurrently writing to the same key, and they're both updating the database and updating the cache. Well, then they might update the database in one order and update the cache in the other order, and now the two are inconsistent. Or if you're uh, filling the cache when you're reading, well, you might make a read and a write concurrently, and so you might fill the cache with a stale value just as you were writing to the database, and stuff like that. It can go wrong in, in all sorts of different ways. Um, Another issue with this is cold, cold start. So if you reboot your, your memcached servers and they lose their entire contents, then suddenly every single request is a cache miss. Now suddenly every request is hitting the database. Your database is overloaded. You have all sorts of pain. So contrast creating a secondary index, which is one line of SQL. The database handles it automatically, keeps everything up to date, uh, and it works beautifully. Contrast that to this kind of application level cache management, which is just a complete mess. <laughs> the fourth thing I wanted to talk about is materialized views. Uh, could you just put up your hand if you know what a materialized view is? Cool, I did say that's about half. So I'll just briefly explain it for those who haven't seen the term before. Um, you've probably seen what a, a non-materialized view, <laughs> a, a normal, a virtual view, whatever you call it, is in a database. Um, you would create one of those in a relational database, typically something like this. Uh, you say create view, give the name of the view. Um, you might define some columns of that view. Uh, and you then define it in terms of some select query. And when you, when you now look at this view in the database, it looks somewhat like a table. So you can query it like any other table. But actually, when you do query it, 
say you select from this, this example here, which is the, the name of the view. Can you see that pointer? Nope. No, I can't see it either, never mind. Um, when, when you query from that, the uh, database, the um, you know, query parser, query planner, will actually go and rewrite that into the underlying select query. So what the database is actually executing is this, uh, this select foo, select from foo, um, and the, the example, this view, is just kind of a convenient, like a wrapper abstraction kind of packaging uh, around that table. And that's fine. Um, com contrast that to a materialized view where the syntax for creating is, is almost the same. The difference is just, you say, create a materialized view. But the implementation is totally different. Um, if, you have, if you create one of these materialized views and you have this underlying table, the table that you're create that you're querying in this internal query. Um, when you create this view, what the database will actually do is scan that entire table, execute that, this query on your entire table, and copy the results out to something like a temporary table or like a, a separate place, and it's actually written to disk there. That's what materialized view means. Uh, like materialized here just means written to disk. Um, this is a, a copy of the entire data that's happening there. The nice thing with this is now that if you query it, uh, if the query is actually expensive, well, the query has already been done ahead of time. So um, querying the materialized view is just the same as querying an actual table. It's just looking at finding it on disk and returning it. Um, the difference is now that the database needs to actually maintain this materialized view. So whenever the underlying base data changes, it has to uh, maintain and update the materialized view accordingly. Now, this is actually somewhat like a cache, if you think about it. The uh, main difference to a cache is that, well, A, it's maintained by the database, and B, is that in an application-level cache, you have a lot more flexibility as to what you can do. Uh, you know, you can have arbitrary application code logic. It might be doing some kind of business logic, filtering the data, whatever. You can, within limits do this kind of thing in a materialized view, like some databases will let you run JavaScript stored procedures inside of the database, uh, which would let you implement something like an arbitrary application level cache inside the database. I don't think I'd recommend like JavaScript stored procedures inside of a database as an application platform really, but it, it could be done in principle. So these are the four things I was talking about. Uh, just to recap quickly, replication, having a copy of the same data on multiple machines. Um, secondary indexing is kind of presenting, plucking out individual fields, individual columns from some data so that you can query it quickly, creating auxiliary data structures from that. Caching is having some modified, transformed version of your data in some external data store and materialized view, the same as a cache, but managed by the database. And what all of these four things, they sound really disparate. What they have in common is that it's all forms of derived data. You're taking some underlying data set and transforming it into something else. What's very different is how good, how good it is, how well it works. So I think replication works pretty well, for example. So I'll give it a green smiley. The, um, uh, you know, there's some, some quirks, of operational quirks of actually making this work reliably and like some of the tooling is a bit weird, but on the whole it's mature, it's well understood replication is actually quite good. Um, similarly, secondary indexing, I was saying like, you know, you can build a secondary indexing while continuing to process writes. That's, that's really awesome. On the other hand, caching, we said, is a complete mess. And materialized views, I'll say, is kind of a, a meh. It's, uh, it's sort of, the, the idea is nice, but, you know, part of the reason for having a cache, for example, was wanting to take load off the database. Whereas if you're doing a materialized view in the traditional way, you actually put giving the database more work to do. So can't we somehow, that there's something really appealing there though about this materialized view because it's kind of a cache that magically keeps itself up to date. I think that's a quite a compelling idea. So why don't we take this idea of materialized views and rethink and, and say, if we're starting from a clean slate, what would like the ideal architecture look like for something like a cache that we build in the same way that we think about as a materialized view. So let me start this way. Um, this is your traditional database architecture with replication again. 
and you're making your writes to the leader and reads either from the leader or any of the followers. And in, in between, you've got the stream of, of replication updates being sent. And observe that this is kind of, this whole thing is packaged up in a kind of one abstraction. It's like one database abstraction. What I mean with this is that this replication stream is kind of an implementation detail. Like how many of you have tried to parse a MySQL bin log before? Or like parse a one person? Or <laughs> parse a Postgres write ahead log or something like that? Um, it's, it's just something you're not meant to think about. It's like this internal detail that the database will take care of it, don't worry. Whereas the query interface, like issuing queries, getting results, that's the public interface of the database. But you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. What if we take this replication log, and instead of making it an implementation detail, we actually make it a first class citizen? That's what I mean with turning the database inside out. Let's take this internal detail and make it a top level thing. So what would that look like? You could call it a transaction log, for example, or an event stream. Um, now, when you're doing this, your writes, you don't have to necessarily make your writes to some kind of leader database. In fact, you could just append your writes to the stream. If you format your writes in the form of these immutable uh, events, of these like facts that I was showing earlier as that example, then you can just stick it at the end of your stream, and the stream becomes a really simple data structure. It's basically, it's conceptually just a file with one single write operation, which is append to the end of the file. That's the only write operation it has to support. Um, similarly with reading, the only thing you need to, be do, need to be able to do is read the records in this log sequentially. And now people have implemented this um, on a kind of larger scale. For example, Apache Kafka does this really well. It does it distributed across multiple machines. It's fault tolerant. Um, it has extremely high performance. You can pump messages through this thing at a crazy rate. And it's really intended for, for this kind of this way of working. It can keep quite a long history of messages as well, which will be quite useful. Um, and now once you have this log, well, you, can't, you can write to it efficiently, but if you want to pick out some, you know, if you want to query it in some way, you can't really read it efficiently. So we need to build our new indexes. We need to build our materialized views and our caches. But we can do that by consuming this log, by consuming this stream. And then you can have multiple of these uh, views, which you derive from the same underlying stream of data. Um, you can have as many as you like. They can just run independently in parallel. Each of these we can call a materialized view. Now you need some way of actually building this kind of thing. Um, so you need some framework for actually uh, being able to write these, uh, write the code which will build your indexes and your materialized views in the way you want, uh, which is actually a stream processing framework. So this is a framework which will take in the messages from the stream as they come in, let you do stuff with it, and let you update some state based on that incoming message. And now this uh, open source framework that I've been working on, SAMSA, does exactly this. And it's designed to work very well with Kafka. And it's designed exactly for these kind of stateful applications. Uh, the nice thing here is that if you want to build a new materialized view or a new cache, what you can do is actually just go back to the beginning of time in your log. The log can keep quite a long history. And just process everything sequentially from the start. And you can do that in parallel across multiple machines, of course, to, so that it doesn't take forever. And there are a few optimizations like compaction, so that if you keep rewriting the same key, then that can get compacted, so that you don't end up using all the disk space in the universe. But the, the idea is, is still conceptually very simple. And as an output, you get this materialized view, which is actually ends up being consistent with the base data set, immune to race conditions, just like what we actually wanted. Uh, some people have called this the Kappa architecture to contrast it with the Lambda architecture. Uh, who's heard of the Lambda architecture as proposed by Nathan Martz, James Warren? Good. Um, this is sort of quite similar to it, but uh, doing away with the batch processing part and saying if you have a sufficiently powerful stream processing system, then actually you can do most of the, this kind of materialized view building directly in the stream processing system. I think that's a really rather nice prospect. Now, 
I do want to take a step back though first and say like, okay, why, what's, what's the point of doing all of this? Like if we're going to change our entire database architecture and application architecture to be centered around this kind of idea of a log, this idea of a log where you only append to it and then you have these stream processes which pick up changes from the log and update views. That's a lot of work, of course, to change everything. Why, what's, what's the point of all of this? So I'd argue that there are three really interesting things that this lets us do. Um, number one, I think it'll actually give us better quality data. So one problem with uh, databases, these shared mutable state databases that we have at the moment, the problem is that they really conflate the concerns of the reader and the writer. So the whole debate about normalization versus denormalization essentially comes down to, do you want to optimize for reading or do you want to optimize for writing? If you want to optimize for reading, which reading use case are you optimizing for? You know, if you're copying a bunch of fields from some table and denormalizing them into another table, you're optimizing for use cases which read those particular fields very frequently. Now, if you're separating it out and you're making your writes just as these events to a log, then you can build whatever materialized views you want. Your writes can be beautiful, clean, normalized, because this part of the system is optimized for writing. Your materialized views are optimized for reading, and you can have different views for different reading use cases. And there you can denormalize all you like, because all of the logic for um, update, you know, the problem with denormalization is how do you know when to update your, your copy that you've, your denormalized data. But if your process for building this materialized view is just this pure function on top of your data, and you can just rerun it at any time, there's, there's no problem at all. You can denormalize as much as you like. So separating out those concerns is beautiful. Another reason uh, why I think we get be better quality data there is actually these, these events are useful for analytics. So take, um, take the shopping cart example again. It's actually interesting to know whether if someone added something to their cart and then removed it again. So the, the end result for the checkout process is the same, like the item was not in their cart. But for analytics purposes, it could be really interesting to know that something went in and went out again. So actually keeping this stream of events of like all the, all the states that the system went through is useful just in its own right as well. Um, Various other nice things you can do, like point in time queries of the past and so on, better recovery from human errors if you mess things up. Um, lots of reasons why I think you get better data. The second reason why I think this is a good idea is um, this idea that your materialized view is essentially a fully pre computed cache. What I mean with that is that there's no such thing as a cold start. You know, if you um, if you want to build a new one, you actually go through your entire history, your entire data set, and build the thing, and it's then complete. So that means there's no such thing as a cache miss. It's not possible to go to the materialized view, not find it there, and then have to go to some underlying data set, because if it's not in the materialized view, it's not there. It doesn't exist. Um, similarly, there's no problem with uh, cache warming after you reboot it because you've, you've built the entire thing and you can rebuild it again, uh, it's compl the complete state, whenever you need to. You don't have to worry about uh, invalidation. That gets a whole lot simpler because the only way how uh, you write to the materialized view is by consuming messages off this log and updating the state accordingly. And that's a very nicely small encapsulated thing. It doesn't infest the business logic everywhere else in the system. The problem of race condition goes away because each stream processor can process the messages strictly sequentially, and you can still parallelize independent parts of your processing across multiple machines, uh, but each individual processor can be strictly sequential. So races simply can't occur anymore in that model. So uh, lots of reasons why I think this idea of a fully pre-computed cache is, is totally beautiful. The third reason is uh, a bit more subtle still, um, and I need to maybe take a step back to explain, to explain it. So we, we could put streams everywhere. What I mean with that is 
think about the life cycle of a request. So say you've made a request to some web app and it's gone all the way through to the database and requested some data from the database. Now the database will return some results of that query is in some kind of raw form and it'll then go into your, into your application logic, some kind of business logic uh, which will transform it in some way. It might do some access control. It might do whatever it needs to do. It might write the results then to a cache. Um, this, is, this is in the traditional architecture. Now uh, the data in that cache will then probably be returned to the client in some form, say JSON over a REST API, and the, there'll be some code somewhere, perhaps on the client, which takes that data structure and then renders it using a template uh, in, into the form where it's displayed, so say an HTML DOM. Um, once you've got it there, well, the browser then uses that DOM. The browser actually transforms that data again. It, the browser has its own rendering engine and it eventually transforms it into pixels in the video memory of the device that you're using. Now, this may seem a bit facetious, but really what I'm trying to say is that the data goes through this series of transformations and you can think of each of these steps as a materialized view on top of the, the one before. So I would say that the data in the video memory, the pixels in the video memory, is a materialized view onto the HTML DOM. The HTML DOM is a materialized view of some JSON that you got over a REST API. That JSON is a materialized view onto some data that's in an underlying database, some, some raw data. Let's have a look at how well each of these works. I think like browser and rendering engines, I think are amazing. If you think about it, like you can update a CSS property somewhere and it automatically figures out immediately which parts of the, the window it has to re-render doing complicated CSS layout stuff. It does that really fast, even on mobile devices. Like that's impressive stuff what they're doing. Um, by contrast, well, if you look at the, that UI logic, I'll, I'll kind of, you know, a strange loop we get uh, probably half a dozen talks about functional reactive programming, and that's kind of uh, the area they're in. They're, they're trying to take some changing underlying data and figure out, like, how do we write our applications in such a way that we can update a user interface accordingly without having to totally redraw everything. And um, I've given that yellow for now. I, I think as, as these frameworks mature, that's, that's quite rapidly going towards green as well. But this part here has traditionally been terrible because at the moment, the way we query a database is very much send a query to it, get a response back, which represents the current state in time of that database. If, that, if the state of that database afterwards changes, tough luck, you don't find, about, find out about it. You know, you could pull the database or you could build some really elaborate system for tracking um, changes in the database. Some databases have started adding this kind of subscription to changes, um, but it's not really like a, it's not uh, in the front of the mind, I think, for, for many designers yet. Um, and what I think this, this log-centric architecture allows us to do is to have this, you have all of these materialized views which are updated off the stream of events coming in using some stream processing framework. And what if we could take those materialized views and let all of our client devices just subscribe to any changes happening there? So that whenever some underlying, some data in the underlying system changes, it can flow through all of these layers, can flow into the materialized views, they can send the change out through a WebSocket or whatever it be to some client application that can then use some functional reactive programming to update its user interface, hands it over to the browser rendering engine, which renders the updated pixels into the video, video memory. If we can get that whole pipeline working really smoothly, we could start building really awesome applications. And right now I feel like the, the weakest point in that pipeline is actually at the database end. So that, the database end and also the way um, the applications talk to the database. So in order to make that better, Really, we have to look at every place where we're doing a kind of rest request response type API and rethink that and say, actually, we want streams everywhere. Instead of making a request, we should be subscribing to some stream of changes. And instead of uh, one response for the state at the current point in time, we want to be notified whenever that state changes. 
Now, this is, this is really kind of a fundamental rethink because um, this request response model is so deeply ingrained in everything we're doing. You know, it's RPCs, all of that. Really, I'm saying here we should kill REST APIs because they're, they're not fundamentally publish subscribe. There are some frameworks which are trying to work in this direction, like Meteor, Firebase, for example, come, in, come to mind. Uh, we need a lot more. I think we need everybody thinking about streams everywhere. Um, that, I hope, has given you a few ideas of, I think, the way we could build applications in future. It's just about becoming possible. Um, here's a bunch of things you can go and read if you want. There's, I, I like to give credit where credit is due, so a lot of bright-eyed people have you know, written about these ideas already. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, hopefully. If you like this kind of thing, by the way, um, my book uh, just came out a few days ago, is kind of thinking at this sort of level. Uh, there's a discount code there as well, which I haven't tried yet, but I've been told that it works. Um, and have a play around with Samza as well. Uh, yes, question, please. Uh, how, how do you deal with uh, Kafka's at, at least once delivery? If you get multiple messages, do you have to have either phone response? Uh, how do we deal with Kafka's uh, at least once delivery? Um, several parts to that. So. For one thing, um, updating a materialized view in many cases will be idempotent. Like if you're taking the, uh, if you're just taking the the latest state of some data, like you know what is the current quantity in the shopping cart, and writing it to data to a database, that uh, that doesn't change if you reprocess it. If you're doing things like counting, then that's not idempotent, so that's a bigger problem there. Um, what's, what's currently in in process there is actually adding transactionality to Kafka itself. So the idea then being that you can uh, transactionally publish a bunch of messages to Kafka in one go and confirm that whether or not they were published correctly based on a transaction ID, even if you lose network connections and so on. And then on the consumer side to simply similar, similarly have a, a tracking, which allows you to then get exactly one semantics. Uh, that's not there yet, but it's in the works. Yes, a very good question. So the question is, the, these materialized views are updated asynchronously. Um, in a traditional database, you can query immediately after making a write and get the results of that write back. In this case, you're not guaranteed that. That's exactly true. Um, I think the most promising approach for that is to actually add transaction protocols on top of the stream model. Uh, so one of the papers I, I included here in this list, I think, uh, let's say, no, I think I forgot it. It's a, a Microsoft research paper on a system called Tango, I believe, um, which is adding transactionally consistent data structures on top of an asynchronous log. So I think there's uh, really interesting stuff that can be done there, but it can be added as a layer on top of it again. How do we deal with schema changes over time? How do we deal with schema changes over time? Um, at the moment, the best answer we have, I think, is that you use a serialization format which allows schema evolution, like Avro or protocol buffers or something like that. Um, you have to then tag each message with the, the schema version that it's at and allow um, updates. So if, um, if a publisher publishes me messages in an old format, then new subscribers still need to be able to understand the old format and vice versa. So the serialization formats work reasonably well for that. Um, I think the detailed mechanics of the operational mechanics of in which order you deploy services need to work out, but I think it's a very solvable problem. Um, especially in the last example where the data is going all the way through to mobile devices, can you talk at all about where security policy or access permissions might fit into that kind of architecture? Mm, where would security policy and access permissions fit in? Um, I, uh, yes. Uh, good question. I, I think it would probably have to be added at the point where the data is then pushed out to subscribers, so at the point where the, the publish subscribe happens. And so you can have application logic in that because this is, if this is running in a stream process somewhere, um, you, know, you can run arbitrary code in there. So it can do exactly the same kind of access control checking as you would do in a, in a typical backend of a, of a web service or so. Um, 
that probably seems like the most promising approach, but uh, better ideas welcome. Does SAMSA have something to manage that? Sorry, does SAMSA does that do the schema management or yes. what? Do you, um, it's SAMSA itself is agnostic to what kind of serialization or data format you want to use. Um, they have, like you can plug in just JSON, for example, for serializing your messages if you want, or Afro or protocol buffers or what you like. Um, so that that's reasonably flexible. So the, uh, the creation of a secondary index isn't declarative yet, as it, as it would be in a relational database. At the moment, you still have to write code which will take one message, pick out the field you want, and then write that to a store. And, and that store then acts as the index. I think that... And the last question, how is that different from Storm? Uh, how is SAMSA different from Storm? That is a good one. Um, so Storm is another stream processing framework. Um, they, they have a few different design decisions along the way. I like Storm a lot as well. It does a lot of things really well. Um, I think I can't really do justice to the comparison in like 30 seconds, so there's a detailed comparison on the SAMSA documentation where we've written in detail about all the various aspects of stream processing and the trade-offs, and I think it comes down to one thing is good for some applications, one is good for other applications. Yes, please, at the back. Uh, so the question was about compaction of the log. Um, how do we can, what the garbage collection process so that the building materialized views doesn't take forever. Um, at the moment, Kafka supports uh, basically two forms of compaction. One is throw data away after a certain point in time, which that works well for event tracking type data where you just want to say, okay, keep two weeks worth of data, for example. And that's only the time interval that I'm interested in. But that doesn't work for key data where you're trying to basically represent the entire contents of a database. Um, so for that, you have to be able to go back to the beginning in time. For that, uh, Kafka supports key-based compaction. And the idea there is simply that each message is tagged with a key. And uh, the, the contract is if you, if you write multiple messages with the same key, Kafka is allowed to throw away all but the latest of those messages. So only the most recent message is kept. Uh, which is actually very similar to what a log-structured storage engine does under the hood as well. So in that case, if you, if you have a kind of key value like data model and you're just keeping the latest value for every key, then actually the total size of the log is proportional to the total size of your database. So then it becomes manageable. Yes, uh, compare this with Datomic. So there, there are definitely some, some interesting overlaps there. I mentioned Datomic, I think, on briefly that it also has this idea of immutable uh, facts that you put into the database. Um, and this uh, idea, I think it's got a totally ordered stream, I believe, as well. Someone correct me. Um, it's, I think Datomic still tries to look quite a lot like a traditional database, which is probably good if you want to actually sell a system nowadays. Uh, because, well, well, people still expect to be able to do random access queries to a database quite, quite reasonably. So like saying, actually, you can't make random access queries. You have to build materialized views for everything by hand. It, it's kind of a, a tall order. Um, but I think it shares a lot of the same kind of ideas and goals. Um, SAMS is kind of designed to be, I think, totally distributed. So I believe Datomic has a, a single node for transaction processing. So all writes have to go through a single node. Um, with Kafka and Samza, it's fully distributed, so there's, there's, no, there's no single node at any point ever, but then, you know, the, that sort of details. Do you have any thoughts about appropriate storage for the materialized views? Uh, do I have thoughts about appropriate stores for materialized views? So Samza comes with a built-in abstraction for state. Um, <coughs> the idea there being that, you know, if you if all you're doing is taking in messages and updating some state based on those messages, you don't really want to talk over the network to some remote data store for every single message because your throughput would just go to hell. And you can do a bit of stuff with caching and batching there, but if your state becomes large enough, that just doesn't help. 
So what SAMSA does there actually is to embed a key value store in process locally on the same machine. At the moment, that's using level DB, although we're looking to switch that over to rocks DB before too long. Um, so that can only be accessed by its local process, but by partitioning appropriately, um, you can then have, have each partition of the stream feed into its own partition of the materialized view, uh, which keeps that sequential right. Uh, and anyone who wants to read from that particular partition of the view then has to go to the appropriate node, so you need some routing there. Does that answer your question? How is this di different from having just a message feed and then storing it in some database? Yes. Um, most of the difference is actually kind of in the mindset behind it. So this is not trying to be a job queue of, um, of you know, put something to be executed asynchronously by another process. It's really trying to actually be a different type of database. Um, there are a few details of implementation, like for example, if you're using RabbitMQ or some or ActiveMQ or so, it'll allow you to reorder messages. Uh, so it'll individually track the acking of every individual message, which means that writes won't necessarily be applied in the same order. Whereas what we're doing here is actually forcing that writes are always applied strictly sequentially, which means that you can, that avoids problems of race conditions. Um, that's one example how, that, how it's different. Does that answer your question? Mm. Okay, we can talk afterwards. Cool, one more maybe. Yes, please. Uh, can you talk more about uh, querying these materialized views? You say it's got an in-memory sort of uh, uh, state. Mm -hmm. uh, do you just have to define a way to serialize that out, or is there sort of more involved? Uh, so how do you query these materialized views? So the, um, the state can be in-memory, or it can be written to disk. So it includes a serialization there already. Uh, at the moment, there's a key value storage uh, engine built in, although you could plug in another storage engine if you, want, if you want to do full text search, plug in Lucene, for example. That would work beautifully well. Um, the way you then query it is that you need to uh, get a, the network request from whoever wants to query it um, into the process which has this local store so that it can then look in its local store and return the result. So you're kind of co-locating the, the data storage and the processing. Yeah? Okay, I'll still be around, so feel free to come and find me. Thank you very much. Enjoy your break.